everyone and thanks for joining us also promptly this evening. Um, we're really excited about uh, another uh, piece of our webinar tonight um, and uh, Mark Kennelly is going to introduce uh, it formally. Uh, thank you very much Anne and good evening everybody. Uh, I just want to welcome you all to this webinar and as Anne mentioned this is the first in a whole series of governance related webinars and equality webinars that Anne and Rory and the rest of the club support team have been organising and is really, really gratifying for all of the staff team to see the level of interest that, uh, the clubs have shown in these events. Again, you know, upwards of a couple of hundred people taking part again tonight. So we really appreciate your interest in it. And, you know, I, one of the part of the mission of Golf Ireland is to Im improve the services we provide to our member clubs and you know, at the moment we're confined to doing this via re remote uh, re remote events, but hopefully later in the year as the situation continues to improve, we'll be able to engage directly with you and your clubs. Uh, another very important priority, of course, for Golf Ireland is promoting and advancing the role of women and girls in golf. And that's why even before Golf Ireland became operational in January, the transition board signed the Women and Golf, the RNA Women and Golf Charter last year. And that was a really important statement of the core values of Golf Ireland. So the, tonight's webinar is about building on the webinar that was held last week on the charter to give more, I suppose, more detailed and practical advice to clubs on how to make the changes needed to achieve gold standard in the in the charter. Just want to on everybody's behalf welcome Sarah O'Shea, who some of you will have will have witnessed in previous uh, webinar events. Sarah has been a huge support to us in Golf Ireland in, in developing our whole governance area, including the governance guide for clubs that was issued back in November. In addition to that, she has a tremendous track record in promoting governance reform and the equality agenda in other organizations, notably the Olympic Federation, where she has been a real driver of change. So we look forward to hearing Sarah's presentation. I'm also delighted that we're joined tonight by Brian Punch from Castle Troy Golf Club and former member of the Transition Board. And, and for those of you who don't know, I have noticed, I have to tell you, Brian was an absolute driver of the equality agenda as a member of the Transition Board. He chaired the club support uh, club governance committee of the board, and that was the. In doing so, he he led the preparation of the, that. Uh, excuse me, club governance guide that was issued in uh, in November, which is really a guide to clubs on how to modernise their their structures. So I look forward to hearing what Brian has to say tonight. Finally. <clears throat> I think we can all say <clears throat> that we're very happy and relieved that every golf course on the island is now open. And, you know, it's been a, we've had a tremendous start in the Republic, the, in, obviously in, in Northern Ireland, beginning of the month in the Republic this week. And I think it's a real privilege for us in golf when you see all the sectors that remain closed that we're open. And we really want this to be the last time we have to reopen golf mm -hmm. in Ireland. So we should all enjoy the weeks and months ahead. We, I think the future is bright for Irish golf, but I really appeal for all of us to, you know, to continue to be di to diligently follow the safety protocols because that's what, how not only will we keep our members and, our, and the wider community safe, but we'll ensure that golf is open and open for good. So thank you all and I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Mark, for that. Um, so just to explain how the evening is going to work, Sarah O'Shea is going to um, go through uh, a presentation a lot around how we can get more women onto our management committees and then Brian Punch is going to talk to us more about the practicalities as to how Castle Troy actually approached um, getting more women involved but particularly how we can get more women and that equality piece out on the golf course which is a, is a common question for clubs particularly very busy clubs who are saying you know their course is already at capacity and how if we open up our timesheets how will we make this how will this actually be possible so I think Brian will be a, a great influence in that. And I think you'll get a lot out of both Sarah and Brian's presentation. Um, so throughout the evening, if you want to ask the same for people who've been on this before, um, if you have any questions, you can just um, type them into that chat function at the bottom and Rory or myself will answer. Anything that we feel should be answered by either Brian or Sarah will leave until the end and hopefully get them answered. 
Uh, so hopefully you enjoy it and I'll pass over to Sarah now. Great, thanks Anne and thanks Mark and thanks everyone in Golf Ireland for setting this up. I see my connection is a little unstable, so hopefully we won't have any issues, but uh, you can let me know if there's any problems. So I'm gonna briefly talk to you this evening about gender equality in terms of its role in governance really, and the, more the theory around gender and leadership, why it's such an important topic, a little bit about the research that's out there, current statistics, and also a little bit about barriers for women going into leadership and some practical actions and steps that you can take um, in your own club. So let me just start sharing the screen. So hopefully you can see that. Okay, is that okay guys? Can't see you, yeah, perfect, thanks Rory. So just, um, just a little bit of a brief back background. Obviously women have been playing golf for a very, very long time. Um, so, um, but just a little bit of women in sport and the statistics. So. This relates to um, national governing bodies in sport, but I think it's a very important statistic to put up there. Um, just to let you know that we're still not there yet with gender equality. And gender really is one of the areas of diversity. So um, just excuse me that I'm talking about gender tonight, but obviously diversity in all areas is very important, but we are specifically talking about gender this evening. So at the moment, and these figures fluctuate a little bit from time to time, but we're approximately 29% women on, on um, national governing bodies of sport boards at the moment, 24% chief executives, 12% chairs. Very interestingly, 44% in the secretarial position. So women have tended to go into those positions or been asked to step into those positions. So while a lot of good work has been done, we still have a long way to go. And it's very important just to, just to remember that. In terms of the research that's out there, I think it's very important as well to have a look at this research. Um, women will only apply generally for, for um, boards and jobs where they feel they meet 100% of the criteria. And that's very, very important distinction between how men and women think about putting themselves forward. Whereas generally men will put themselves forward if they meet 60% of the criteria. Now that's interesting research there from 2008, it's still very valid now from a business case for women. So I think that's very interesting um, because it's very important that we understand that the way women and men think different. Again, in the workplace, women will only apply for promotions when they meet 100% of the qualifications, as opposed to men who generally apply if they meet 60%. And that's from a research uh, done there by Forbes magazine in 2014. So um, it's just important um, kind of backdrop that men and women are obviously very different in how they see leadership about putting themselves forward. And the same kind of um, issues apply when we come to elections in sport as well. Just want to make sure you can you can see me there because I can't see you. All okay? Or yeah, great. And um, so another piece of very important research um, is from the Institute of Directors in Ireland, and this is tone from the top. Now, while this relates to boards, it is um, very relevant also to clubs, to sports clubs or sports national governing bodies. And what they found is that forty two percent of people who get onto boards were approached by an existing board member. And 67% of those who go onto boards knew up to three people or more on the board before joining. Now, the point that the Institute of Directors were making here is that the lack of diversity within a board in this case, but it can equally apply to a club, means there's a natural leniency towards uh, picking people like yourself. So um, if you're a generally a male board or a male committee, um, it's more likely you will reach out to people within your own network. And it's not done on purpose. It's more of a, an, an unconscious, subconscious thing that happens. So it's just worth knowing that as well. And I, I search. We also saw this citizens assembly decision as well. And an important one here, some of the decisions that they have recommended to government on leadership and politics uh, to make funding to public bodies contingent on reaching 40% gender balance by 2025, um, enacting gender quota legislation requiring private companies to have gender balance on their boards 
and making public funding to culture, sports, arts and media organisations contingent on a quota of 30% representation of women. So um, I don't want to bombard you with facts, but the Citizens Assembly have brought, have brought those recommendations in uh, this week. So we are going that direction very rapidly towards quotas, towards mandatory areas in relation to companies and the corporate world, but also sports there. And remember, a lot of sports are organized as companies. So they are private companies. So that's a, a very important statistic to remember. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about barriers. Um, I was involved in a consultation for Sport Ireland a couple of years ago with a colleague, um, uh, Lisa Clancy, and we did a research project and we looked at research all around the world and we looked at research in Ireland. And that consultation that we did has formed the basis of the new Sport Ireland Women in Sports strategy. What's very interesting from the research that our, came out of our research is it matched research from the UK and other parts of the world, is that um, these, these are the kind of barriers that women express that they have in relation to stepping into leadership positions. Um, a top one is confidence. And it's not that women don't have the, the qualifications or the skill set or they're not confident in their own abilities, but they do question about should I put myself forward for that position? Am I good enough? And that goes back to the research I, I showed you there earlier. They question themselves a lot more um, than men generally do. And we are generalizing here, but that is the research that comes out. And um, women also like to be asked to step into positions. They don't naturally put themselves forward. Um, they like to be um, contacted and suggested and proposed and approached. So that's something very important in your club. If you find that women aren't coming forward, Sometimes um, women like to be contacted and asked to put themselves forward for positions. So that's, that is a difference between men and women in relation to uh, stepping up into leadership positions and elections, et cetera. A lot of women expressed um, areas around, they don't want to be the token, they don't want to be the tick on the box, they don't want to be the only woman on the board, uh, they don't want to be the lone voice. And um, so very important as well that we make the environment very comfortable um, and in, if, if you're a club trying to promote women into certain positions. Um, women express a dislike of club politics, uh, sports politics. They didn't want to be involved in that area. They just wanted to get in and do a good job. Um, they also wanted to understand what the role was. So role descriptions. Generally, women, when they've gone into positions, will ask for, you know, what's the job? What's expected of me? And without knowing what the role or the role description is, they tended to shy away from particular positions. <laughs> Um, availability as well. Now that has changed to a degree with going online, which has been really beneficial. And um, but women, when we did our research, did express that they don't have the time and commitments as well due to um, family um, commitments, be it childcare, be it elderly people, or um, mainly you know looking after things at home as well. So the time that board meetings were on, the time that club committee meetings were on, just didn't suit them in their lifestyle. Quotas came up a lot, and there's a, there's a lot of different views on, on quotas. Um, but most um, of the women in the research out there are leaning towards quotas being very important um, because I suppose time has elapsed where um, in sport in particular, you know, uh, <coughs> the national governing bodies have been asked to come to the table and improve the situation, but it hasn't come far enough. So the idea of quotas is becoming more uh, popular amongst women in terms of the leadership uh, position um, and, and um, encouraging each other to put themselves forward for boards or committees, et cetera. Just want to talk to you a little bit about, Mark mentioned, I'm Honorary General Secretary of the Olympic Federation, but just a couple of key points. Um, we took a big step last year in relation to gender quota on our board, the Olympic Federation. Um, we had no quotas in relation to the board at all. We had 12, on the board, three women, um, Sarah Keane as president, myself, Henri General Secretary, and Georgina Drum from Athletics were on the board, and we had nine men. So being in a position that Sarah Keane and I were in, Henri General Secretary and president, we decided we had a responsibility to take action in this area. So we proposed to our board, a majority of men, that we would bring in a quota system, and we would be the first, I suppose, leader in, to, to a degree in this area. And, and make it mandatory within the Olympic Federation of Ireland. So that's what we decided to do. And instead of going to 30%, we decided ourselves we'd go for 40%. Um, and we got unanimous 
a support from all of the men on the board. And that meant some of them losing seats, losing positions of power. So we're very proud of that, very proud of our colleagues on the board of the OFI that they agreed to do this. And when we put this to the membership, we were concerned about what were the membership up at the AGM? Would they go with this, a predominantly male um, AGM as well? And again, unanimously from the floor, this was passed by our male colleagues. So really important that if you think something can't be done, it can be done. And there are you know, many men in club committees, many men on boards who are very supportive of gender equality and very supportive of bringing these type of targets in. So very important. As it happens, we ended up through an election process because we didn't want to interfere with the elections. We developed quite a complicated system of making sure we had enough women candidates and then enough women on a waterfall system to coming through, but we ended up with 50% women on the board uh, and our target was 40. So huge support from all the sports. So the point of this is, you might think this might be difficult at club level, but I have no doubt um, there's more support out there for this than, than you, you would even think or expect. We also proposed this as well at European Olympic Committee level, and that was passed unanimously um, in a very archaic organization, which is predominantly run by, I suppose, the Eastern Bloc, and it was proposed and passed. I think there was uh, one, one, one country didn't vote for it, um, and that was it. So um, there's a lot more support out there for this than you think. So be brave. And you know, if, if you want to make changes, I think you will get the support in, in your particular clubs. Um, about implementing change and, and back to how you go about it. Very important, first of all, to understand the membership you know, in your club, the, the, um, how it's made up. Um, what are the barriers in your own club in relation to uh, gender equality and women stepping forward for elections or committees or positions within the club? Um, is there a tradition in the club that it doesn't happen? Is there a certain culture of the club? Um, and, what are the, and have a think as well about those, those other barriers I mentioned that women naturally fall into. Very important as well when you're trying to bring in change is not to um, you know, dictate to the membership. Try to have a discussion about this try to have consultation and get buy-in from the club committee. Very important and very important to have ambassadors, particularly men in the club who will promote gender equality within the club. Um, the principle as well, I talked about this in my governance seminar about passing through and about giving up power positions is very important here as well. And as I said, in the Olympic Federation, some of the men around our table lost their position but they, they didn't mind doing that because they felt this was a very important legacy for the organization going forward, okay? Um, and leading by example. So very important, if you're talking about gender equality, that people within the club lead by example and take the necessary steps. So what can you do in practical reality to take action? Well, really uh, keeping gender equality on your agenda, really important at club committee level, um, remembering what I've just put up there in relation to barriers, that men and women are not motivated the same way. And that is what the research says. Um, men will much more easily put themselves forward. Women like to be asked to put themselves forward. So remember that if you're trying to encourage women within your club, is you may have to go out and actually um, find women to come into the, into the particular uh, committees if they're not 50-50 balanced at this point. Um, I know in golf, uh, there's a variety of different structures. So this is just the general um, general theory we're talking about here. Um, we talked about briefing the membership and making sure that all your working groups uh, would be a good way to start in your club are for both genders. So if you've got any kind of club committee up and running or an ad hoc working group, just make a point of making sure there's half men and half women, um, ideally, where possible on those working groups and on those committees and try and promote that as much as you can. And that's the point about leadership. If you can start this at working group, committee levels, um, you can progress that um, through gender equality throughout the whole club. Seeing is believing. So very important to have female role models as well. And where you have women in positions within your club that are doing great work, very important uh, that they're made visible and that other women can see that, that there's a pathway within the club to step up forward for election or whatever the case may be. Um, and we know all the research out there also shows that having more women on a traditionally male committee or male club does bring new perspectives, it does bring new ethics. And in fact, in the corporate world, they are finding it's actually changing 
the uh, stock exchange and the share prices of different companies who've brought in quota systems onto corporate boards. So I think that's very interesting. Um, I know we're talking about sport here, but it's interesting that, 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 that if that is the case in the corporate world, then we should be uh, recognizing that um, in sport as well. So again, um, just to remind you as well, set up a, a governance committee, which I spoke about before in my governance sessions, um, and try and put gender equality into the agenda of your governance committee. Um, if that's not possible, then set up, you want to set up a special working group on gender equality, that you can do it that way either, but try and set up a working group of some sort, be it through the governance committee or some other working group. Make sure there's clear terms of reference and outcomes about what you as a club want to achieve in relation to gender equality. And I know you're all very different and you're all at different levels of this journey. Um, so, but very important as well to examine your constitution. Um, your constitution, and we are doing a template constitution for clubs over the next number of months, but your constitution as well might be outdated. It might be archaic. There might be a lot of male language in the constitution. So it needs to be re-looked at as well and rethought through in relation to gender equality. Um, do up a matrix as well of positions available on your committees to see um, how are people elected on your club committee? Um, is everyone elected? Are there nominated positions? Are there appointed positions? Can you co-opt? Because if you're finding it difficult that women coming through the election process, you could identify how gender equality can be brought through by nominating or co-opting um, women into uh, the club committee if they aren't coming through the election process. So that is very important as well to have a look at your current structures and have a look around the club as well and look at unconscious bias of imagery and language. Um, you know, the imagery around the golf club and the language around the golf club, uh, president's boards, the photography, everything like that. Just have a look at it as well from the point of gender equality, making sure the environment and the language is open for women around the club. And as I said, lead by example. OK, so, um, you know, gender is about team. Um, it's not about men, it's not about women, it is about everybody working together. Um, and I'm a very strong advocate um, of making sure uh, that what men and women are in this gender discussion together as we would be with any other diversity group. Uh, so it's very important, this is not a topic uh, about women, just for women. It's very important that um, men are completely um, on board with this topic, which I know they have been in the example I gave you with Olympics and other sporting bodies. Um, so thank you, that's a very quick whistle-stop tour, conscious of time. So I've just given you a very generic, general kind of governance flavor to gender equality, and hopefully um, you will um, have got something out of the research that's there and the barriers that you may not have been aware of before. Sarah, thank you very much. Thanks very much. I think that was really helpful. I think um, for clubs that are working on that gold standard of trying to encourage more females onto their management committee, that will certainly give them some guidance um, and some clear uh, action points that they can take from it. Uh, we do have a question there that I, I'm going to ask you just before we move on to Brian, um, which is, while the club might have set up a 50-50 working group, there's concern that for the other uh, groups, how can they justify um, having a 30-30-40 representation if, for example, there is 70 or 80 percent male in the club? Um, so that th this comes up quite a lot. Um, we obviously know that within golf, there's 22 percent that are female um, across the board. So this does come up quite a lot. Um, we know that Golf Ireland took that step forward uh, and really wanted to push the boundaries. It wasn't about what we have now. It's about where we wanted to get to. Do you have any advice on that, Sarah, yourself? Well, I think it's just buy in again and consultation with the membership. Um, you know, it, it's about explaining that regardless of the membership of the club as a whole, you know, women do bring a perspective, a different dynamic. Uh, just because there might be more male members in the club doesn't mean a woman can't be objective and, and you know, have valid views and opinions and skill sets to bring just because there's more male, male members in the club. And, you know, it, it works both ways. Absolutely. So I think it's just about consultation, talking to the members and looking at this from a governance perspective, um, that it's not about how what percentage of members we have in the club, that it is good governance to try and bring in 
you know, 50-50 or 40-40-30, whatever may work for the particular club, but trying to encourage gender equality regardless of the membership structure. I don't know if that answers the question, Anne. Yeah. No, that's really um, um, yeah. Sorry, Anne, could I make a very... Okay. Yeah. A very quick point on what just to endorse what Sarah said earlier about you know that the appetite for for the equality agenda and the potential for it could be a lot higher a lot more than we than, than we anticipate because as people know I mean we we have embedded a 30 30 40 gender requirement in Gulf Ireland and in the two levels of decision making that we have completed now both the national board where we have 46% of the members of the national board are women. And I think even more tellingly in our regional elections, which we held in October and November, we ended up with a well over 40%, I think it's 42% female representation. And that was the, 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 that was the decision of the clubs, you know, voting for the best candidates. So we actually greatly ended up greatly exceeding the minimum requirements. So that says to me that we have you know, we have a really great potential to replicate that at club level. It will take time. I think to start, you know, we've had a very, very good start, and you know the clubs have, you know, chosen to go way beyond the minimum requirement that, that is set out in our constitution. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. I think that's really helpful for clubs as well. So just before we move on to Frank, so I think he's just setting himself up there. Um, how how would you recommend that um, clubs would brief their their memberships uh, on on this topic? How can they get by, and how how have you seen it approached before? Well, I, I think the working group is the first thing, and that has to be fifty fifty. Um, and I think it's good to have very strong ambassadors, and I, I have to say, strong male ambassadors are very important here. And there are I, I said it this evening quite a lot, but I'll say it again. Um, you know, um, men are very supportive of gender equality has been my experience. I mean, men have wives and sisters and children and, you know, they're very, very, very supportive of gender equality. So if you have strong male ambassadors in the club, the membership will listen to and look up to and they're advocating for this and parallel it's been advocated from a governance perspective. I think that is the best approach and it's then talking to the membership and inviting people onto that working group that might have good views on how to do that so it shouldn't be just a group of women trying to bring this through it, it's really really important and um, that men and the club are, are brought into this and, and leading as well in this area okay brilliant i think some of the oh, other things that are going to help i don't know if that's me um uh, some other things that are going to help in, in in the coming weeks and months are um for people who are on the women in golf charter webinar last week we mentioned about the ch charter champions which is where we're hoping to get male and female um champions within each club uh, to really champion what we're trying to do here with the women in golf charter and and those as sarah says the ambassadors within the club and having a whole network of ambassadors is what we hope will continue to drive the change and hopefully help each of your clubs as well uh, move this forward so Sarah mentioned leading by example. She's mentioned male um, ambassadors. So we are now going to talk to someone who has most certainly led by example and been a great male ambassador um, for this particular agenda. And he's going to give us some practical steps here. So we're going to do it as, a, as quite an informal uh, Q&A style. Uh, so would you like to tell us, Brian, a little bit about the background of Castle Troy and why the club decided to look at gender equality? Okay, I will indeed. Thanks, uh, Anne, for inviting me on. Uh, maybe I should start by saying this obviously is an experience of mine in Castle Troy. Uh, hopefully people will find it useful and informative. It may or may not totally apply, obviously, to your own club, but it'll give you some thoughts and some, some background. Uh, just to give you some as a background, Castle Troy, um, and I, I need maybe to start this, I need to go back to the early 2000s just to kind of put, the, it, put it in context. At that stage, the club had a membership of about 1,100, um, 800 male, about 300 ladies, and maybe 100 ju juniors or juveniles. And at that stage, maybe they, there was a, a kind of a feeling that the club had got so large and the demands on members or particularly to get members to volunteer 
to come forward for office was becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, and that was probably one of the main drivers for, for the change that came into the club at that stage. And a decision was taken by, I suppose, the ladies and the men's captains of the day and those that were in office at that stage to see if we could split the functions in the club between the, kind of the business side of the club and the golf side. And a proposal was brought forward to actually go down what is now kind of the management committee with male and females and the agenda being uh, 30, 30, 40 and the things that are, are in the governance guide. I won't go into too much detail on that, but that started and that kind of set a tone. And moving on then from that a few years later, we had set up a management committee and quite a number of new members had come in at that stage. And I suppose like all new members, different ideas, younger people coming in, uh, started to kind of ask questions about membership and entitlements and various things like that. And that became sort of a, a driver in itself. Um, the other thing was that the club at that stage was thinking of investing very heavily in doing up the golf course. So you were going to be out in the marketplace looking for a couple of million, which the bank would look to replay. So those two things kind of coincided and it was decided by the management committee of the day to set up uh, a subcommittee to look at the various types of membership and categories and subscriptions and there were concessions to aids and various things, family membership, all that sort of thing. So a proposal was eventually brought forward to regularize the membership to what we now kind of have, which is one adult membership for all, regardless of gender, regardless of family or that. So there's just, the, if you like, one, one adult membership with some concession for age and indeed to get it over the line in, a, in an EGM, as some concessions to people who were already there. I suppose one of the big issues and the big talking points at the time was the, de the decision, uh, there were 300 ladies in our club, as I say at the time, all of whom were associates. And there was a lot of debate as to whether those people would have the option of remaining as associates. And <clears throat> we, the committee of the day took a decision largely based, I'd have to say, on some sister clubs that had already gone down this road where they had chosen to leave the option open. And we, from an observation, found that it actually gave rise to a lot of bother out on the golf course on the timesheet between full-time members and associates and all this. So <clears throat> based on that, we took a decision, go all in. And on the night, it was carried overwhelmingly. So it turned out maybe to be the right decision with a with bit of luck and the benefit of hindsight. So the next, I suppose, move after that was naturally, again, with new members, I suppose, different work patterns, uh, both people in a, in a partnership or in a marriage <clears throat> were both working. Obviously, weekends then became the critical time for people to play golf. And traditionally, that had been a male preserve. Uh, and the male competitions were played at the weekends. So again, the, bo the board of management set up a subcommittee to kind of look at options of that. And they have, it, within our own club, it's the board of management who allocate the time or control the timesheet over the week. And all slots on the timesheet over the seven days, you have to book for it whether it is casual golf or, com or competition golf. So they allocated, if you like traditional things like senior ladies play on a Monday morning, senior men play on a Thursday. But again, there were no particular problems with that. Ladies day was Tuesday. Nobody had particular problems with things like that. The weekend again being the issue. Again, having debated it for a considerable time, it was decided that the best thing to do was to run a trial period 
to open up the time sheet initially on a Sunday morning and to see the outcome of it. In fairness to the members, they were open to that. Maybe a bit of the usual, some people maybe not as happy or less happy maybe, I'll put it that way, than others. But anyway, people agreed to give it a, a trial run. And I have to say, like a lot of things that change, within a month or two, nobody was saying particularly too much. It was a question of whoever came on the timesheet first. So on a Sunday morning, you would have uh, maybe four ladies playing at 10 o'clock with four men playing at half nine or 10 to 10 within the timesheet. So you had a men's competition, you had a ladies competition over, over the day. Generally in our own club, up to about one o'clock is when the, the demand is there. The afternoon on a Sunday tends not to be, particularly in the summer. Uh, I suppose just to put it in context, Limerick, because it's not on the coast in the summer, a lot of people go to the Kilkees and the Lahinches and things like that, but they'll play Sunday morning and go down on, on Sunday afternoon. So the, the, the demand was really on the morning. One way of getting over that we found, there were, there were a number of things kind of that system threw up. One was that to accommodate the kind of numbers, now our numbers had fallen like every, every other golf club since the recession. And we were down to around 800, about 550, 250 women. So there was still quite a demand for the Sunday morning. And to accommodate people who wanted to play in competition, we extended the Sunday competition to a Saturday. So you could play, well, you call it the Sunday competition, but it could be played either a Saturday or a Sunday. And we had taken that up with Golf Ireland or with GUI as it was and the ILGU at the time. Even if the, even if the, if the pin positions were changed, you were still able to, to play the same competition. The ladies did a variation of that where they traditionally, ladies day was a Tuesday and that they played their competition on a Tuesday. So they took a decision for some of their bigger competitions in particular to play, have it open on the Tuesday and it was open on the Sunday as well. So people had an option of playing either day. And that seemed to you know, facilitate and suit most people. Some people, uh, maybe had gone beyond the stage of having young children at home or things like that. So Sunday wasn't a, a particular problem for them. And they wanted to play on the Sunday, maybe on a Sunday afternoon indeed. So that has settled down. That's in being now for a kind of a number of years. And I have to say you now, and, and I suppose I can only talk for myself and maybe other members in my own club might have a slightly, might have a different view, but I can only give you my view of it. I, I don't foresee, it, it, I haven't seen any problems on it. I don't hear any males saying that the ladies are holding us up or vice versa, or males saying the ladies are, are may, maybe at times, it, if I was honest, <laughs> the, the ladies might be saying the men are holding us up, <laughs> um, depending on your age and how far you hit the ball and all that sort of thing. So it has settled down very well. It has become kind of the norm. People are in the habit now of booking you find like a lot of things, these things, people book their preferred time if they can get in around that stage. So if you look at any typical timesheet, you see the same name sort of coming up around the same time. But it does show that everybody, regardless of gender, have the same access to the course and to the timesheet. And it can work, which is maybe the, the critical thing. So. Brilliant, Brian. I'm going to ask you another couple of questions uh, that I know will, will come up. I think that that has really set the tone for, um, you know, ripping the band-aid on some of those uh, historic things that golf clubs have and that actually the success to that as well uh, and that it does become a norm. I think sometimes we, we fear change much more than when it actually, when it happens, actually, it, it just becomes part of the norm. As you said, it embeds within that month and six week period that you spoke about. Uh, I think the trial is a very good option. Uh, many clubs have spoken about doing that and, and proposing that to their members uh, versus it becoming a real uh, scary risk that this could uh, go, go terribly wrong for the club. 
Um, some of the other things that, that clubs are, are usually interested in as well is around um, how did you engage with the associate membership at the time uh, to help them move across that they weren't feeling alienated um, and that, you know, that we could retain them? Because there's a lot of fear out there that actually if we try and move some of the associate membership into, into full, mm. that they perhaps won't be retained in the club and they'll go elsewhere. Now, bearing in mind that in the Republic, obviously with the equality legislation, if they go elsewhere, they will have to become full members. But yeah. there is that fear that there's this, you know, we'll, we'll alienate a, a, a section of um, our clubs, which obviously no club wants to do. I suppose one of the things is like a lot of these, like a lot of change, you actually have to work at it. So in our case, we had set up a subcommittee of the board of management, which of itself had male and females of it. And the subcommittee, had a similar gender diversity on it. And um, I suppose, uh, fortunately, the people on the subcommittee were seen as committed to the club, as so was an expression I use, without agendas, and were seen as open to what was good for the club. Uh, and a lot of work, if you like, was done um, by that subcommittee Firstly, in drawing up maybe proposals, but then in sort of sounding those out with, I suppose, other people, other maybe like-minded people, seeing how they were likely to travel, taking advice on a kind of on a maybe a semi-private before going out in a, a grandiose way. So there was a lot. It was a fair amount of sort of tic-tacking to see. Uh, is this a stupid idea or is this or has it no hope of traveling or should we tailor it in, in some other way? Um, at the end of the day, I suppose you, you, you have to make a judgment call as to whether uh, you, you can go so far, I suppose, with what I'm saying, and you, you can kind of say, yeah, that will that has a, has a, a high probability of success. But you don't want to go so far just to get success that the thing doesn't still make sense to you and it's not it's not achieving enough. Uh, I think you have to be kind of ambitious about it at the same time and decide, yeah, you know, this this is the right thing to do and we should be doing this. And I think one of the things, and, and I know it's one of the questions you've asked me, and I was just thinking about what have I learned or say from my own experience in my own club. I think one of the things I've learned is you have to be, and Sarah has mentioned this as well, you kind of have to be proactive in it and kind of keep listening to your members. And, and if you want to kind of change and the dominant thing in, in this place was, if it was a, gen, a gender itinerary, the males were as important as, as the females in it. So you needed to tick tack with people who were well recognized within the club and were seen as kind of open and had contributed to the club and didn't have agendas and were doing it for the good of the club. And I think once you kind of go down that road, um, I think people will believe you and, and give you a fair hearing. And then it's up to the subcommittee, I suppose, to make their case and let it stand or fall on, on its merits. Super. There's a couple of questions coming in there. So one of them is around, do ladies get to play on Saturday? Yes. Timesheet again is the same. Um, and Saturday is a timesheet, same as Sunday, same as a Friday. So all seven days are timesheet and it is open. Uh, now, there are, uh, in point of fact, even within, call it an allocated uh, competition time for say the men ladies could still can still play in that within the time sheet so whilst you like traditionally there would have been a couple of hours blocked off for the males to play a competition and nobody else could get in on it that has now changed with the open time sheet yeah i think that will help a lot of clubs um there are, are people questioning just around the annual subs for associate membership. Do you know if there was a stage progression to that or were they converted straight over to having to pay um, what the full membership was straight away? Ultimately, it, the decision was taken to, to go all in. 
and it traveled. Now there was, um, within that, there was, uh, a, 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 there were an age, an age subscription concessions if you were over 70 or 75 or 80. And they were, they were continued and they were applied obviously to the ladies, to the associates as well. Uh, but they were, they were subsequent. If you were existing of that age, you held on to them. But for new members, you lost it. As indeed you lost the option of family membership. Um, again, the argument was really, I suppose, to do with, there was a price if you wanted to vote. And that became a kind of a, a key driver, if you like, of it. I mean, you, you can't, if you want the vote, there's a price to be paid for it. And you have to make a decision on that. Is that what you want? And if you, um, again, I think going back to some of Sarah's earlier slides, you, you know, you have to make moves to do certain things. Her own experience on the Olympic Council, I think, has shown that things can be done. Uh, but you, you, if you want to get diversity and gender on, on committees, you have to have people in a position to be able to vote in sufficient numbers so that it won't always be male or if the shoe was on the other foot, it won't always be female. And you would hope that you'd get a stage then that people would just vote for the, the best candidate on the day, regardless. Yeah, I think that that's 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 really helpful, and I think some clubs, um, just for for reference as well, um, some clubs don't just jump into having to pay full membership. There's quite this is covered in quite a good bit of detail on the level part toolkit, which everyone who's on the webinar tonight will be circulated. And there's also a section within the governance guide uh, that both Sarah and Brian were involved in, in writing. Um, and if some clubs do choose to stagger that payment, but ultimately moving associates into full does mean that they would have to pay the full membership because then it, it, it obviously makes them equal and then that gives them the rights and benefits of a full membership which should mean equal access to the golf course and to competitions and then obviously as Brian has referenced the vote as well. Um, another thing Brian that does come up as well is, is the concern around uh, junior so if we open up this timesheet um, how are we going to manage all the, the, the influx of juniors that may want to play as well? Because we're already going to have quite a busy timesheet if we're now going to open it up for both male and females to be able to play. How does Castle Troy tackle that? Uh, again, it's a matter of kind of managing your, your seven days timesheet. Obviously, in the summer, youngsters are off. So they tend to get an allocation from half seven or eight o'clock till half nine or 10 o'clock, depending on the numbers. Of it. I suppose in our own club, we probably have about a hundred juniors, but on any competition day, there's maybe 30 or 40, that kind of, and they're male and female. Um, they all, you also find uh, that Sunday afternoon in particular in the summer, tends for the reason I'm saying that people go to the seaside, and it, you know, there's that tradition here in home in Limerick. So you will you find that competitions are often run around three or four o'clock on the Sunday afternoon. So between um, I think Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in the holiday period, summer and Easter and things like that, subject to the, the daylight, obviously, they get an allocation to play early in the morning. Obviously, the better juniors, the better in the sense of handicap. If they're down to a certain, I, I think off the top of my head, it's either 10 or 11 handicap. They become eligible to play in call it the adult competitions under certain conditions. They must go out with an adult. and They may not be eligible to win the captain's prize and that kind of thing. But, so they get an opportunity to test themselves based on their handicap. So that's how it, and it, it doesn't appear to be creating any great problem. Again, I suppose, their times are a time that may not suit everybody, but they're a time that I suppose doesn't seem to be a problem for the youngsters. They're out early, uh, they're finished at, and they come in in normal times before the COVID, they come in for their burger and chips and all the rest and they're collected around lunch hour. So they're around the club for the morning and they're collected or, you know, there's some way of going home. Castle Troy is in a built up area. So a lot of the juniors 
come from the hinterland anyway, and a lot of them can walk up and home with their bags and their golf clubs. So it, it, it hasn't it hasn't created a problem for itself. Okay, that's really helpful as well. And I think some what some other clubs do as well is that they might open up the timesheet to their full membership on say a Saturday and then juniors so that, that they're getting priority booking and that the juniors might be able to uh, book in from say the Tuesday onwards. So if there's slots available, then obviously they're available to everybody as well, but it is giving priority because sometimes that is a concern that opening it up. Uh, but as you say, in a lot of clubs, they will have policies uh, and um, Golf Ireland will shortly be coming out with a, a junior policy as well, which should help clubs around how to get juniors out on, onto the course as well. Um, in general, how would you, do you rate um, that the changes were received by the wider membership? I know you referenced earlier on that there was, you know, some people who maybe weren't as keen. Now it's fully embedded in your club. How, how do you think that the changes um, are viewed? I think, no, it's there a good number of years at this stage. And I, I don't hear it as a topic of conversation anymore. It's sort of taken as a given. I mean, if anything, I suppose, it's, it's not a gender related issue. I mean, there could be pressure on a particular popular time on the timesheet, but that's not because of gender. It's just purely numbers. And indeed, um, maybe as a, as a, a byproduct of, of COVID, as we know, numbers have started to rejoin golf clubs again. So I noticed in the last year in particular, getting on the timesheet, has become not, nothing to do with competitions, but just people anxious to get back out. So obviously, if that continued, you just have to look at the timesheet and make sensible decisions on it. But it is no longer, as I say, a gender-related issue. Okay, brilliant. Uh, this one might be one for Sarah. There's just a question that's come in. Uh, we, we just have a few more minutes. So that there's a question here, um, which is around the club seeing the one club model as an opportunity to restructure the fees, especially with regard to the ladies. This is a female who's written in, um, but the club have actually set up a, a male subcommittee and they refuse to set up that joint committee that we're mm -hmm. recommending. Um, how, how can, um, is there any suggestions that we can give uh, to this club as to how to influence uh, perhaps setting up that subcommittee that we've spoken about uh, and is referenced in the governance guide? Well, it's that's kind of a difficult one, I suppose, Anne. You know, it depends on personalities and lots of things. Mm -hmm. Brian referred to tick tacking earlier, and I would fully concur with certainly my experience having worked in sport for a long time, and especially on the political side of things, which is, happens at club level as well, is that you really have to have one on one conversations with people and to a degree. I would say divide and conquer, try and find one or two people that will listen to your perspective in terms of changing the um, makeup of that committee. If it's one person on the committee, you can talk to two people on the committee and try and let them bring that forward and back to the committee to say they've had a conversation with a few people in the club who have concerns and that they would um, like the committee to reconsider. Um, you know, and, and maybe people don't have to lose their seats. Maybe they can bring in a few more people onto the committee. So I think it is having one-on-one -on -one conversations and to use Brian's phrase, tic-tacking and, um, you know, trying to, I mean, there's no point, you can't force situations sometimes. You just have to get people to understand your perspective and um, try and get them to buy into that and, and try and uh, uh, make sense to them. And hopefully, again, it's about having an ambassador so you can find someone on that committee who will listen and, and bring it back. Maybe Brian has something to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with Sarah there. I, I suppose the only, uh, just then think a bit more of it, I suppose, depending on how indicative that is of your club, uh, I don't know if this is a kind of a one-off on committee. Um, if, it's, if it's not a big deal, Fair enough, but if it becomes a kind of a big deal, maybe at some point uh, you kind of have to make a decision: is is this the battleground that you you're going to to bring up? <laughs> now, I wouldn't be ne necessarily recommending uh, jumping in like a bull in a, in a china shop because I, I'm not a believer in that. That that gets the results either. I, I'd much prefer 
person needs to be kind of working behind the scenes and getting to a stage where people come with you willingly. But <clears throat> you do find in some stage, if there's a total resistance and for whatever reason, uh, you, you know, you have to make a judgment call sometimes as to, do I make a stand on this or is this indicative of the whole attitude in the club or is it just the particular individuals who are on this committee? as against the total one. Hopefully that has helped that club. I, I think, um, and, and we can maybe take it offline as well and, and give some, I think that they're really strong um, advice there from both Sarah and Brian. Uh, Brian, there's just one in there for you. Um, we've just got a couple more minutes, so we'll ask a couple more. Um, in, in Castle Troy, do you have five, six and seven day membership or is it just <laughs> seven day membership? Uh, just seven day membership. We've never had uh, a demand for it. Yeah. Our, our membership, as I say, in its peak times was up at around 1100 and was capped at that. Now, there, were, <laughs> there was a waiting list, but again, times changed, I suppose, and um, there wasn't the, the need for the five, six, and seven day. So we went down the other road. Brian, someone is asking at the, the time that this all changed within the club, were you one of the champions uh, and, and were you a person of influence, basically, as in, were you a captain? Were you involved yeah. in, the, in, the, in the piece? Yeah, yes. I was on the board of management. I was captain in 2004. Excellent. OK. Uh, and then this is a question just uh, and we can answer from a golf arm perspective. But we'll just ask you, Brian, uh, do the junior and intermediate members have a vote or is it only full members in um, Castle Troy? Uh, only full members. Um, if I just think now, only full members. Uh, I think if they're, yeah, they're, we have a changeover at 18. If you're not, that can be extended to 22 or 23. I'm open again to correction that if you go on to further education, uh, which is why the 22 or 23, be it an apprenticeship or third level formal education. So um, because you're not kind of paying a full sub, the vote doesn't kind of come with it. The vote is, if you like, associated with the sub. Yeah, and that, that was something that was discussed quite at length um, by the, the, the governance subcommittee that was set up by the transition board. Uh, and in the level part toolkit, there is a recommendation from Golf Ireland that uh, any over 18s uh, would be given a vote because um, they're on their way to full membership. So perhaps they're reduced because uh, they're in that student membership category or an intermediate one. Uh, and it's just simply that they're on their way to, to full membership. So it is something to consider. Uh, we understand that it, it might be a very radical change for some golf clubs, uh, but it is our belief that you know, the more people that can vote within the clubs, the better. Uh, I'm just gonna, there's one more there, uh, which is just, it, it speaks about the, you know, the, the discrimination piece around associate membership being available to uh, women and not to men. Um, I think it, it really depends on what jurisdiction we're on. So we might take that one offline, but I just didn't want the person to feel that we were ignoring them. Uh, you can certainly follow up directly afterwards and um, we'll answer that one. I think everything else was answered. There was some, there was a, a, just a, a statement in there around finding that some of their female members were upset that they would see this as a loss of identity. Uh, is anyone else finding this? And I think that a lot of clubs, I, I, I don't know whether you're talking about associate membership, but there certainly is, you know, people have strong feelings towards whatever category of membership they are in. And if it's mm -hmm. been what they deem to be ripped away from them, that can cause quite a lot of upset. So I think Brian and Sarah have spoken about it quite a lot and, and communicating and getting that sense check is just so vitally important to, to get buy-in. Um, yeah, just so, if I could, and to, to yeah. add that, in case I'm giving you the impression that the move in my own club from associate to, to full for associates <clears throat> didn't bring pain and financial pain, if you like, and all it did, I suppose part of it was the selling of it, that you were sort of putting forward a different vision for the club. Everybody was going to be on the same standing. Now, I have to say at that stage, there wasn't an open time sheet. But <clears throat> I suppose the telling of the story was sort of saying, look, everything is, once you get everybody to the same point, each person would have a vote. Anything is now possible. 
Uh, so that was, you know, you, you had to sell it along, along a certain line and hopefully people saw value in that to the extent that they were prepared to put their hand in their pocket and pay extra. Because for a lot of people, they were getting relatively little. They were quite happy with their lot. They didn't need golf on a weekend, you know, and all that sort of thing. But I think for future generations, a lot of them signed up to it. And I think that's the important thing to remember. We are going to wrap it up, but it is for the future generations as much as it's about uh, your membership. Now we are obviously wanting to be uh, a sport that is around for many generations to come. And we do need to look at how we can modernize and, and you know, be um, more acceptable to both men and women of, of, of all ages. Um, um, so thank you very much to both Brian and Sarah. Uh, I think it was brilliant. It was really good engagement from um, everyone who was on here this evening as well. So thank you very much for that. It's great to see um, so much discussion and interest in this topic. Um, you know, we do have development and club support officers that are available to, to support your club through this journey. And we've got some really good practical guidance documents which will be circulated to each of you after this as well. Uh, but please um, do get in contact with your development and club support officers. They are there to help and it's all free of charge. And we should make that clear as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to see such strong attendance. Uh, and hopefully next week is a, is a one club model webinar and it is outlining Golf Ireland's vision for what that means. So hopefully you'll be able to join us on that as well. So thank you very much. And thanks again to, to Brian and Sarah and Rory and Mark. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Thanks, Sarah and, Bri and Brian. Thanks, Have everyone. Bye. Bye, all. Bye, Sarah.